In this presentation, we will consider Matthew chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, and then Luke chapter 3. As always, I would encourage you to read these chapters before watching or listening to this presentation so that you'll have the story, the background, and already be familiar with some of the things I'll focus on. Those listening in audio format only, I do this as a YouTube presentation, so there are slides with this. If you want to see those, you can go to that on the YouTube channel, Coming Unto Christ, uh, Michael S. Clough. So by way of background, let's take a look at the times that John the Baptist lived in and that Jesus is coming to. This is from Brother McConkie's The Mortal Messiah. John came in a day of spiritual darkness and apostasy. The world was ruled by Rome, and Rome was the world. Everything that was carnal, sensual, and devilish was enshrined. It is not too strong a statement to say worshipped, as part of the imperial way of life. Adultery, incest, abortion, all were a way of life among the Romans. There was no accepted standard of morality and decency, and little or no belief in the immortality of the soul. All the gods of the nations of the empire were reverenced and worshipped in the capital city, and the emperor and others were deified and adored as, uh, adored as gods. Sacrifices were offered on the great altar in Herod's temple to the emperor and for the well-being of the empire. The Jews themselves, in general and as a people, no longer walked in the light that was once was theirs. If ever there was a need for a voice to cry out in the wilderness of wickedness, calling upon all men to repent and turn to the Lord, this was the day. If ever there was a voice prepared in pre-existence, schooled in the home of faithful Levites, and tested and made ready in the deserts of Judea, this was, this was prepared to proclaim the word, to mark the way to all, to say to all, This is the path, come and walk therein. Here is the Messiah, follow him. That was the was voice. That voice was John's. So, a very wicked time. A time of much worldliness and iniquity abounded. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3 and consider some things in this chapter. Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 through 2 says, And in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'd like to focus on that word repent. If you'll notice in the LDS version of the Bible, repent the footnote to Matthew chapter 3, verse 2a says, The Greek word denotes a change of heart or mind. That is a conversion. So when John comes out and says, Repent ye, the kingdom is at hand. He's saying, Change ye. Change your hearts and change your minds from this wicked, decadent society that you live in. Come be converted to the gospel that I am now preaching among you. In the church to Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, we do not just teach ethical principles. According to John's command to repent, which denotes a change in a person, we are to teach by the power and authority of the Holy Ghost so that a change of heart takes place in the lives of those whom we teach. Without a change in the natural man towards Christ, then conversion has not taken place. This is our cardinal rule in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, that one converted to Christ and his gospel is changed from the natural man to a new creature in Christ, willing to submit to his will in all things. So we just don't teach a nice ethical principles way of life, and these are good standards even. No, we teach to change. We teach by the power and authority of the Holy Ghost to change people's hearts and minds so that they come unto Christ. That's the message John is trying to send. That's the message we should get. 
we are to change our hearts and minds, little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7 says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee the wrath to come? Why are you coming out here? You won't even accept my gospel. Who has warned you? The Joseph Smith translation, Matthew 3 to 34, which is Matthew foot, Matthew 3a, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 3, verse 8a says, Why is it that you receive not the preaching of him whom God has sent? And if you receive not this in your heart, you receive not me. And if you receive not me, you receive not him of whom I am sent to bear record. And for your sins, you have no cloak. Your sins cannot be covered by the atonement if you don't accept him. And they can't accept him, meaning Christ, unless they accept John. So that's what he's saying to them. Why, why are you coming out here if you don't even accept my gospel and what I'm preaching? You don't accept me as the true church, in a sense. Because then you won't accept him. John is not the Christ. That he makes very plain. John makes it perfectly clear that he is not the Christ that was come that was to come, but the one to prepare the way for Christ's coming. However, John must be accepted for what he was, the forerunner to prepare the way. Otherwise, men would not accept the one of whom he came to testify. You must accept that I have power and authority to restore that I am restoring Christ's church. Why is it that you receive not the preaching of him whom God has sent, he asked. If you receive not this in your heart, you receive not me. And if you receive not me, you receive not him of whom I am sent to bear record. For your sins you have no cloak, as we just read. Joseph Smith adds that great phrase in there. You cannot receive Christ unless you receive his servants who were sent to testify him. That's as true then, true today as it was then. If we don't accept Russell M. Nelson as the prophet seer and revelator of this church with his two counselors and the quorum of the twelve apostles as his prophet seers and revelators, then we cannot receive him. They go hand in hand. And that's what John is trying to tell them. Now let's take a look at <coughs> excuse me, Joseph Smith Matthew chapter 3, verses 38 through 40. On the slide you can see the italicized words or the words that Joseph Smith added in that had been taken out. Let's see what this teaches us. Joseph, Joseph Smith translation, Matthew 3, 38 through 40. I indeed baptize you with water upon your repentance. And when he of whom I bear record cometh, who is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, for whose place I am not able to fulfill, as I said, I indeed baptize you bef before he cometh, then when he cometh, he may baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. See, John only has the Aaronic priesthood. Christ will have the Melchizedek so that he can bestow the gift of the Holy Ghost. Back to the Joseph Smith Matthew. And it is he of whom I shall bear record, whose fan shall be in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But in the fullness of his own time will burn up the chaff with unquenchable, unquenchable fire. See, John was preaching more than just the church. He knew all of Christ's mission. See, that, that's in reference to his second coming. Thus came John, preaching and baptizing in the river of Jordan, bearing record that he who was coming after him had power to baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said this in his New Testament commentary, quoting or speaking in first person, 
as John saying, I indeed bap, in essence, John is saying, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall not only baptize you with water, but with fire and the Holy Ghost. I am not the Messiah, for the Messiah shall baptize with fire. He it is who shall cleanse and perfect the lives of men. He shall sanctify their souls and prepare them for eternal life. He is Christ, the great judge. He shall reap the earth and harvest the ripened sheaves. With the winnowing fan of judgment, he shall separate the wicked chaff from the righteous wheat, gathering the wheat into the celestial garner and burning the chaff in the depths of hell. His threshing floor is the whole world. And so Joseph Smith had so many significant things about who was bringing the Holy Ghost, who was going to baptize with fire, why we need baptism. Baptism of water comes first, then the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. And that's only upon the conditions of our repentance. If you don't repent, baptism means little, and the reception of the Holy Ghost will not come, even if the ordinance is done and you're not worthy. It, it may be pronounced to come, but if not worthy, it, it, he will not come unto an unclean temple, an unclean person. Let's take a look now at Joseph Smith's translation of Matthew 3, verses 43 and 44. It reads, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer me to be baptized of thee, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. This is when Jesus comes to John. And so you can see some of the words, the italicized, that Joseph Smith adds here. Suffer me to be baptized of thee. Christ humbles himself and goes to John, for he is the one who is administering that ordinance at this time. Even though later Jesus will baptize himself, but Christ now comes to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And John went down into the water and baptized him. Well, he who was holy, who did no sin, and whose mouth was no guile, whose every thought and word and deed was perfect, even he came to John to be baptized. Why? Not for the remission of sins, for he had none. Not to please the people who revered John, for his message was to stand or fall on its own merit. Not because he needed the Holy Ghost, for the Spirit had all, had, he had with him always. He came to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness, meaning to accomplish all that was required of him according to the terms and condition of his Father's plan. The Savior also must keep all of the same commandments I must keep in order to gain exaltation in the celestial kingdom. He too is bound by law. He is not exempt from keeping the commandments. And so let's take a look to fulfill all righteousness. Second Nephi chapter 31 verses 5 through 12. I'm now going to summarize. I think it's five points. On Nephi tells how he fulfilled all righteousness. Why Christ needed to be baptized and he could not return to the celestial kingdom unless he too was baptized. Not for the same reasons we are but to keep the commandments. Let's take a look at how he fulfilled all righteousness. Number one, to signify his humility before the Father, meaning to show that according to the flesh, he humbled himself before the Father. So one, he humbled and submitted to the laws and ordinances of the Father's kingdom, the celestial kingdom. So humility. Number two, as a covenant of obedience. He witnesseth unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping his commandments. He came not to do his own will, but the will of the Father who sent him. So we see his total obedience. Number three, to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, 
As we are aware, this was a formality only in his case, for he being holy and without sin, the Spirit was his companion always. At baptism, he simply went through the form that is required for all men, and that he should have done so is manifested by the fact that the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. And so that he can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, not that it was he didn't have it before, but to show the way, to be an example for us. Number four, to gain an inheritance in the celestial kingdom. His baptism showed unto the children of men the straightness of the path and the narrowness of the gate by which they should enter, he having set the example before them. Even he had to enter by the same gate, and that gate is baptism. All of these quotes and quotations here are from Second Nephi 31, 5 through 12. And then number five, as an example to all men, to mark the course and chart the way, to show them the path they must follow. He said unto the children of men, Follow thou me. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, can we follow Jesus, save we shall be willing to keep the commandments of the Father? Christ is... You and I cannot say that others follow me. No, we don't keep it perfectly. Christ is the only one who could say that. Follow exactly what I did in my life. The courses I did, the courses, the course I made in life, the commandments I kept, the obedience that I did... Do all of those the same, and you'll inherit the same kingdom that I will inherit. Let's take a look now at Joseph Smith's translation of Matthew 45 through 46. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And John saw... So he sees it with his own eyes. Joseph Smith adds that. That's not in the King James. And John saw, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon Jesus. And lo, he heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. We are to heed to listen and heed to the words of the Savior. Hear ye him is added by Joseph Smith. That's not in the King James Version either. Elder Bruce R. McConkie writes some very important things, quoting Joseph Smith, about what this descended like a dove of the Holy Ghost means. All four gospel authors recorded that the Spirit descended like a dove. Luke adds that he also came in bodily shape, and the Book of Mormon account says he came in the form of a dove. That's 1 Nephi 11.27 and 2 Nephi 31.8. So John actually sees the bodily personage of the Holy Ghost descend. Continuing Brother McConkie. Joseph Smith said, now he's quoting Joseph Smith, that John led the Son of God into the waters of baptism and had the privilege of beholding the Holy Ghost descend in the form of a dove or rather in the sign of the dove in witness of that administration. Then the prophet gives this explanation. This is Joseph Smith. The sign of the dove was instituted before the creation of the world, a witness for the Holy Ghost. And the devil cannot come in the sign of a dove. The Holy Ghost is a personage and is in the form of a personage. It does not confine itself to the form of the dove, but in the sign of the dove. The Holy Ghost cannot be transformed into a dove. But the sign of a dove was given to John to signify the truth of the deed as the dove is an emblem or token of truth and innocence. You see what he's saying? The Holy Ghost came down in bodily shape in his spirit personage, but he descended in the sign of a dove or in the serenity and truth and innocence of a dove. 
That's how John knew as a sure witness that this was the Christ. It thus appears that John witnessed the sign of the dove, meaning that he saw the Holy Ghost descend in the bodily shape of the personage that he is, and the descent was like a dove. What an experience John had as he sees such celestial and sacred things. No wonder he bore such a strong testimony that this is the Lamb of God. This is the Christ. This is him. I saw the sign that Satan cannot duplicate. The Holy Ghost in bodily shape come down like a dove, serenely, peacefully, and in truth. Let's now turn to Mark chapter 1. See what it tells us. Mark chapter 1 verses 1 through 2 says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. John's coming, as Mark has it, was the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, meaning that John proclaimed the good news about Christ and salvation, that he laid the foundation and started the work, that he called the first group of true believers, and that, in reality, he set up the kingdom of God, meaning the church of Jesus Christ again on earth. John brought the first converts into the church of Jesus Christ of the meridian of time. He laid the foundations upon which the Lord Jesus and the apostles built. The prophet Joseph Smith said, Some say the kingdom of God was not set up on the earth until the day of Pentecost, that John did not preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. But I say in the name of the Lord that the kingdom of God was set upon the earth from the days of Adam to the present time. Whenever there has been a righteous man on earth unto whom God revealed his word and gave his power and authority to administer in his name. And where there is a priest of God, a minister who has power and authority from God to administer in the ordinances of the gospel and officiate in the priesthood, there is the kingdom of God. Remember, the kingdom of God means the church of Jesus Christ, his church on earth. Continuing Joseph Smith's quote, Where did the kingdom of God begin? Where there is no kingdom of God, there is no salvation. What constitutes the kingdom of God? Where there is a prophet, a priest, or a righteous man unto whom God gives his oracles, there is the kingdom of God, meaning his church. And where the oracles of God are not, there the kingdom of God is not. So Adam held the oracles of God, Revelation, prophet, seer, and revelator. He was a prophet. He was a priest. He held them because he priesthood. Therefore, Christ's church was in the days of Adam. He's saying the same applies all the time there were these were on the earth. John held the oracles of God. He was a prophet. He was a righteous man. He was a priest. Therefore, he started. He restored, remember, the Jews were in an apostasy at this time, a state of apostasy from the truth. So John comes down and restores the church back to the earth and starts preparing the way for the Christ to continue to restore it. Continuing Joseph Smith's quote, as touching the gospel and the baptism that John preached, I would say that John came preaching the gospel for the remission of sins. He had his authority from God, and the oracles of God were with him, and the kingdom of God for a season seemed to rest with John alone. But says one, the kingdom of God could not be set up in the days of John, for John said the kingdom of God was at hand. But I would ask if any if it could be any nearer to them than to be in the hands of John. The people need not wait for the days of Pentecost to find the kingdom of God, for John had it with him. And he came forth from the wilderness, crying out, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is nigh at hand. As much to say, before we continue the quote, in, in, in other words, John 
a lot, lot of gospel scholars and a lot of Christianity says, well, the gospel, the church wasn't set up until Pentecost. No, the church is set up by John. He is recruiting new converts into the church whom Christ is preparing them for Christ as he will take over to run the church. Back to Joseph Smith. That is much to say. So he's now, Joseph Smith's now saying, John is now saying, out here I have got the kingdom of God and you can get it. And I am coming after you. And if you don't receive it, you will be damned. And the scriptures represent that all Jerusalem went out into John's baptism. There was a legal administrator, and those that were baptized with the, were subjects for a king. And also the laws and oracles of God were there. Therefore the kingdom of God was there. For no man could have better authority to administer than John. And our Savior submitted to that authority himself by being baptized by John. Therefore, the kingdom of God was set up on the earth, even in the days of John. And then finishing Joseph Smith's quote, It is evident that the kingdom of God was on the earth, and John prepared subjects for the kingdom by preaching the gospel to them and baptizing them. And he prepared the way before the Savior, or came as a forerunner and prepared subjects for the preaching of Christ. And Christ preached through Jerusalem on the same ground where John had preached. And when the apostles were raised up, they worked in Jerusalem. The gospel was in the days of John, I'm sorry, Adam, in the days of Enoch, in the days of Noah, as in the days of Abraham. They held the priesthood. They were prophets. They held the Melchizedek priesthood. They were the oracles of God. Therefore, the church was there. The kingdom of God was there. John restores the kingdom because Israel was in a state of apostasy and had lost the truth between the two testaments. So John restores the gospel and is now bringing new converts into the new church of Jesus Christ of Meridian Day Saints. And then when Christ's mission comes, when his time for him to start preaching, John will turn it over to him. Let's now go to Mark chapter 1, verses 18, 16 through 18. This is, tells us about when Peter was called to be an apostle. Verse 16, it says, And now as he, Christ, walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Now what I'm going to read to you next is a quote from a talk Joseph, Brother McConkie gives in explaining these verses and what they mean. Now, Jesus' ministry lasted three and a half years, and Peter was with him virtually all that time. Initially, apparently, he did not spend his full time at it. He went off with his partners, James and John, into the fishing enterprise that they ran. He must have been ordained an elder somewhere along the line. But in any event, when the time came for the call of the twelve and for him to come and devote his full time to the ministry, Jesus met him and his two partners on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and said, Come ye after me, and I will make unto you to become fishers of men. That's Mark 1.17. This was the occasion when he ordained them apostles. Then he took them up on a high plateau above the city of Capernaum, where the multitudes followed and preached the sermon, which was an ordination sermon. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. At least from that time on, Peter and the others devoted virtually full time to the ministry. They were with Jesus continually. It would have been in the home of Peter that Jesus spent his time when he was in Capernaum. Capernaum was known as the city of our Lord. That was where he dwelt. Peter lived there. And so in the first part of the Gospels, Matthew chapters 2, 3, 4, Luke 2, 3, 4, you, you see Peter, they come and they behold the Christ. Yes, we have uh, Nathaniel, Philip and Nathaniel said, look, look, we found the Christ. Come and see him. And, and, they, all, and they all start to follow him and they... And they are baptized by John and they join the church. But it's on this occasion in Mark chapter 1 
And I think the equivalence of these would be like Matthew 5 uh, or Matthew 4. Matthew 4, where the Savior goes to the shore and now calls them, I want you now to come with me full time. And so this is the time where he calls them to be apostles. Let's go to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 2 read, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea, and of the region of Tracon Traconitus and Lacin Licinius, the tetrarch of Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. When these verses were introduced to some of the major players of the Roman leaders and some of the high priests of the Jews at this time, now here's just a quick rundown of what each one of them are like, again showing the time period in which Christ and John are preaching in. Bruce R. McConkie writes, Luke identifies the time and describes the day by the simple expedient, ex, by the simple expedient of naming those who had temporal and spiritual rule over the people. First, Tiberius Caesar, an evil and wicked wretch who walked in all the ways of the Caesars, who went before the Caesars, who came after, and who ruled with all the despotism of Augustus, and reveled or, yes, reveled in all the vices of Caliglia, set securely on the throne of the world. Rome ruled the world, and the world was wickedness. So there's a little bit about Ti Tiberius Caesar, a very wicked individual. Pontius Pilate, an evil Roman underling who chose knowingly to send an innocent man to the cross, lest Tiberius hear the rumor that Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews, who was governor of Judea. The scepter now departed from Judah, left the chosen people in Gentile hands, and the Gentiles' hands strangled the Jewish religion. So you have Gentiles running Israel and J Jerusalem in that area under Pontius Pilate. Herod Antipas, an evil ruler whose lust and incestu inc incestuous life fitted the pattern of the Herods, and whose, who chose to slay the innocent forerunner of the Lord rather than be embarrassed before his court, was tetrarch of Galilee, and he, ruling in lust and evil, invited a satanic gloom of spiritual darkness to cover his kingdom. Again, another very wicked and evil individual is this tetrarch at the time, Herod Antipas. Philip the tetrarch, though a milder and more humane ruler than Antipas, yet carried in his veins the blood of Herod the Idumean and was a symbol of the worldliness that lay upon Jewish Israel. Though less evil than his brother, his rule was far from that which is inspired from above. So can you see that the secular leaders are very wicked, very evil. They're living in a time where there is a lot of wickedness and evil. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, Luke also speaks also of Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests which is itself an announcement of the spiritual degeneracy of the nation. In olden times, high priests were called of God, not so in these days. Annas had been appointed by Quirinius. So these, they, 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 they were appointed by secular leaders. That's not how the high priest of the Aaronic priesthood was chosen. Annas had been appointed by Quirinius, and we may suppose he had such influence with the Lord as Quirinius was able to confer, which was not enough, however, to keep him from being disposed by Valerius Gratus, Pilate's predecessor, who then named Caiaphas to be presiding position. So Caiaphas is appointed by a secular leader, not by revelation and called of God and laying on of hands. 
He was deposed in due course by Vitellius in AD 37. Caiaphas was the son-in-law of Annas, and both of them exercised power and influence with the people. So we have secular people putting in high priests who were not called of God to be in charge of the Aaronic priesthood. You can see the apostate nature of the times. Let's now look at Joseph Smith's translation of Luke 3, verses 4 through 11. All of these, as you're going to see, are italicized, meaning this was totally left out from the King James Version. These verses, 4 through 11, that John knew the entire mission of Christ. I'm going to read this and listen to how much he knew about Christ. It, it was more than, oh, this is the Christ and I must baptize him. No, he knows who he is, his mission, everything. Not just during that time, but also his second coming. So here is a Joseph Smith translation, Luke 3, 4 through 11. As it is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, and these are the words saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. For behold, and lo, he shall come, as it is written in the book of the prophets, to take away the sins of the world, and to bring salvation unto the heathen nations, to gather together those who are lost, who are of the sheepfold of Israel. Yea, even the dispersed and afflicted, and also prepare the way and make possible the preaching of the gospel unto the Gentiles, and to be a light unto all who sit in darkness, unto the utmost parts of the earth, to bring to pass the resurrection from the dead, and to ascend on high to dwell on the right hand of the Father, until the fullness of time and the law and the testimony shall be sealed, and the keys of the kingdom shall be delivered up again unto the Father, to administer justice unto all, to come down in judgment upon all, and to convince all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have committed, and all this in the day that he shall come. Well, hold it. Christ is already there. What do you mean shall come? Meaning when he comes again, the second coming. For it is a day of power, Yea, every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. The crooked shall be made straight, and the rough shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. See, his second coming, all will know him. He will come in great plow and glory this time. Do you see how much John the Baptist knew of the mission of Jesus Christ? These words inserted in the ancient record by the prophet Joseph Smith as the spirit of revelation rested upon him, contain such a wondrous outpouring of light and understanding that they give an entirely new perspective as to how and what manner the gospel was preached in the meridian of time. John was not, as our King James Version leaves us to assume, taking Isaiah's messianic utterances relative to the second coming and applying them to the first coming. Rather, he gave an inspired summary of the mission and ministry and work of the promised Messiah as it pertained to both of his comings and as is af affected all men of all nations. The Deliverer will come, not as a temporal king, but to atone for the sins of the world, to bring salvation to the Jew and Gentile alike, to gather Israel, to make possible the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles, to bring to pass the resurrection, to return in glory to his Father, and to reign with almighty power. Then, in the fullness of time, he shall come again to administer justice and judgment unto all, and to condemn the ungodly for all their evil deeds. And this shall be the day when every valley shall be exalted and every mountain shall be made low. So writes Brother McConkie and his mortal Messiah. John knew the whole plan of salvation. John knew the whole mission of Christ. First coming, second coming. No wonder he was such a great prophet. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 14, and the JST of Luke chapter 3, verse 13, concerning the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Bruce R. McConkie writes concerning these verses. Among his hearers, among those who fell under the spell of his voice, were many of the Pharisees and Sadducees. 
Even they, feeling the great swell of emotion that accompanied his, John's words, and being swept along by a great tide of popular approval, came to be baptized. But an inspired priest does not baptize an unrepentant person. Baptism is of no avail without repentance and contrition and confession and a compelling determination to walk even after in a newness of life. That's why he says, why have you come out here to be baptized with me? You, you haven't repented of anything. I'm not going to baptize you, Pharisees and Sadducees. I don't do that. Baptism is for those who have repented. Continuing Elder McConkie. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, demanded the voice that read the hearts of men and knew of the damning influence of these leaders of the people. His words were scarcely less of a rebuke than would be those of another voice in another day which would say to the same hypocrites, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? That was Christ who said that in Matthew 23, verse 33. But even for these there was this hope, Repent, therefore, and bring forth fruits meet for repentance, John commanded. Repent first, be baptized second, and then you will be fit candidates to receive the Spirit from whom, for, from him who cometh after me. See, that's how we know they were coming out here. And being baptized, it was the popular thing, and John was well known. And they seemed to accept his authority, but they hadn't repented. He says, repent ye. No, I'm not going to baptize you until you've repented. And you accept and are willing to become members of the church. Continuing Elder McConkie, and further, think not that you are above the law of repentance, that you keep the law of Moses and need not to change your lives, that you will be saved by the rituals and performances to which you have bound yourselves. The Pharisees had turned the law of Moses into God itself, that if you just lived it perfectly, then you would be saved. That's what John is preaching against you cannot live up perfectly. You will always make mistakes in sin. Therefore, the law of Moses cannot save you. But they had turned it in. The law of Moses was to point to Christ and bring people to Christ. And then he would save them through his atonement and grace. But they had shot beyond the mark and missed the whole point. Going back to Brother McConkie, think not to say within yourselves, we are the children of Abraham. We only have power, and we only have power to bring seed unto our father Abraham. Think not to say, we have kept the commandments of God, and none can inherit the promises but the children of Abraham. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Know this, God is able, and now he's quoting from something Joseph Smith, of these stony Gentiles, these dogs, to raise up children unto Abraham. So two things the Pharisees and Sadducees had done. One, they had turned the law of Moses into salvation itself, not Christ. That's why they're having a hard time accepting him. When he says, I've come to fulfill the law, and he's changing things, they're coming unglued because they think the law will save them. If it, if, if it can, then you can't change it. This is why they're having such a hard time. And two, their arrogance of their lineage. Well, we're the children of Abraham. Therefore, only we can be saved. And John tells them, no, I can take the stony Gentiles and I can save them. I can, through the law of adoption and through baptism, I can bring Gentiles into the house of Israel. Brothers and sisters, let us not be in our arrogance think that we are saved because we belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and someone else doesn't. We have to be careful of our arrogance and our lineage. Lineage does not save you. Christ saves you. Having invited these self-sufficient, self-righteous, self-saving souls to repent, the incisive and blunt speaking John then gave them this warning. Even if you do not repent and save yourselves, know this. The axe is laid at the root of the tree, the tree of formalism and mosaic performances, the tree that saves only the seed of Abraham, the tree of dead and evil works, all the trees that cumber the vineyard of the Lord. 
and every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. If you decide not to come and join the gospel, I will cut you down. The Christ will cut you down and you will be cast into the fire. Hearing John's denunciation of their self-appointed leaders, perhaps fearing lest they too might be hewn down and cast into the fire, those who were repentant and had been baptized asked, well, what shall we do then? What course is expected of us? How shall we conduct our affairs, lest these evils come upon us also? So the people there around who had just joined the church said, well, we don't want to end up like Pharisees and Sadducees and be cut down. What is expected of us? His answer, he answers, bear one another's burdens, help the poor, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, live as becometh saints. This is part of your baptismal covenant. He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none, and he that hath meat, let him do likewise. And to the soldiers, many of whom must have been the Gentile troops garrisoned among them. See, isn't that interesting? Even soldiers came out to be baptized to John, and they had repented. These were Gentiles he was bringing to the church at the very beginning of his ministry. Now, as a whole, as a people, the Gentiles will come in later as a, a mass. But at the first, we have these Gentile soldiers who have come out to John and been baptized and have repented. So to them, he counseled. Your military rank does not give you the right to be cruel or inhumane to your fellow man. Do violence to no man, neither curse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Well, here, just in closing, is a little, some excerpts on the baptism anciently. Baptism was an ordinance that has been around for a long time. We know that from the Book of Mormon. We know that Adam had baptism. And so here are some thoughts on baptism anciently. Many, if not all, of traditional Christianity believe that baptism for the remission of sins started with John. Such is not the case. See, there are many think this is when baptism was introduced into the gospel. Well, from Latter-day Revelation, we know that that's not true. Baptism is an eternal ordinance and was instituted in the beginning with Adam, see Moses 6, 51 through 56, 66, and was practiced by the Jews before John. Isaiah tells of the whole house of Jacob coming forth out of the waters of Judah or out of the waters of baptism. That's 1 Nephi 20, verse 1. Paul says, all our fathers were baptized unto Moses. They did all eat the same spiritual meat, he says, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that they followed, that followed them, and that rock was Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. From the time Lehi left Jerusalem until the resurrected Lord ministered among his seed 600 years later, we find that the whole Nephite people performing baptisms for the faithful and repentant souls. John himself was baptized while he was yet in his childhood. That's Doctrine and Covenants, section 84, verse 28. Alfred Edersheim, a great 1800s biblical scholar, says that the baptismal ordinance administered by John was not new. Quoting Alfred Edersheim, Hitherto the law had it that those who had con contracted Levitical defilement were to immerse before offering sacrifice. Again, it was prescribed that such Gentiles as become proselytes of righteousness or proselytes of the covenant were to be admitted to full participation in the privileges of Israel by the threefold rites of circumcision, baptism, and sacrifice, the immersion being, as it were, the acknowledgement and symbolic removal of moral defilement corresponding to that of Levitical uncleanliness. So he's showing that even before Christ, they were immersing people for cleanliness, the Jews were. Our knowledge of the real purpose of baptism lets us know that it was not simply to remove Levitical defilement, as such has been defined by the rabbis, but was in fact for the remission of sins. What the Edersheim statement does is establish the fact that baptism was common among the people before the ministry of John. 
In this connection, Edersheim quotes this significant passage from the Talmud. These are the writings of different rabbis through the centuries prior to Christ. So in Jewish scripture, the Talmud says, A man who is guilty of sin and makes confession and does not turn from it, meaning repent, to whom is he like? In other words, he is like to a man who has in his hand a defiling reptile, who even if he immerses in water of the world, his baptism avails him nothing. But let him cast it, that rep, defiling reptile, from his hand. In other words, repent. And if, in, and if he immerses in only 40 say of water, immediately his baptism avails. That is to say, baptism without repentance is of no avail. Even those who wrote the Talmud knew this. So even prior to John, the Jews were teaching they went through a cleansing ritual of immersing in water, and that before you did that, you needed to repent before you did that. John came as a legal administrator of the old dispensation. He overthrew the kingdom of the Jews, and he ushered in a new day. He was, as pertaining to the new kingdom, the only legal administrator in the affairs of the kingdom that was then on the earth and holding the keys of power. The Jews had to obey his instructions or be damned by their own law. That's a quote from Joseph Smith in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 276. It was now his baptism, the baptism of John, that counted, not any other. As it was among the Nephites when the Lord took a new dispensation to them, the Jews had to be baptized over again. John was the new head. For the moment of the earthly kingdom, they must turn to him. He was now baptizing, and it was his baptism that was binding on earth and in heaven. As I told you before, remember, Israel's in a state of apostasy. No one has the real authority to baptize. It is restored through John. John now is the legal administrator. And to come into the church of Jesus Christ of Meridian Day Saints, one had to go out to John. He was restoring the church back to the earth. And then after about six months or a year or so of his preaching, Christ now comes and begins his ministry and will start to take over for John. And so baptism wasn't something new. Baptism is not something that started with John. But baptism. Restoring the true church again onto the earth started with John. Well, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and please consider subscribing to my channel.